men, I got to tell you, register for that conference. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be a beautiful time. The women had an amazing weekend. Ladies, yes, heard uh, incredible stories already of what God has done in the last few days in, in the women. And I'm telling you, God is going to move powerfully in the men uh, in a few weeks. It's going to be so good. Uh, it's been a big weekend. We also have about 100 uh, students that have been at a retreat this weekend that are driving back. I think now they call it the encounter retreat, and I believe that God encountered them powerfully. There's no cell service there, so we've not heard any stories yet, but I believe that that is going to be uh, uh, the testimony that comes back. Um, last Sunday morning during worship, as I stood here, um, I, I just had such a hunger in my heart. Uh, for the power and the presence of the Lord to be active among us. Does anybody have a desire for God to move powerfully in your life? I mean, there was just these moments where you're, you're very aware of it, and I, I've just been so aware of just this desire. So when that word came forth today, all I could think is, burn, baby, burn. Come on, burn for Jesus, right? How many want to just burn for Jesus in your heart? I mean, he wants us to burn. The invitation was, I've, I've set you here, I've placed you here to burn for me. And I'll tell you what, when we burn in our hearts for the Lord, when his, his fire and his presence are burning on the inside of us, it changes everything around us. And uh, my heart is that he would rest upon us as a people, that he would be in us and he would rest upon us powerfully. And, and we know that, that he is with us, we know that he is upon us, but but we know that there's more. We know that there's more. We know, does anybody just have a sense there's more that he wants to do in my life and through my life than what I'm currently experiencing? That, that is the spirit in us saying, I have more for you. Um, and we know this because of what Jesus said would be ours. Um, we know this because of what we saw in the early church as we read the book of Acts. We we see what the early church walked in and we say, hey, we want what they had and a continuation of that in our day and in our time. And I am so hungry for that today. My heart really burns for the simple prayer of Jesus that just says, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I just thought, as we start um, this message out today, could we just lift our hands all over here? If you're watching online, you can do it with us in the family center. And can we just say, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come on, sing it, say it again. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The kingdom of God. Yeah, you can give him a shout of praise. It's great. The kingdom of God was a central message of Jesus. And when we talk about the kingdom, we're talking about the rule. We're talking about the reign. We're talking about the dominion of God on earth as it is in heaven. And we, his church... Turn to somebody and say, you're his church. Look at him in the eyes. Tell him, you're his church. You're his church. We have been commissioned. We have been sent to join him right now in seeing his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. I want to tell you today, regardless of what you see in the headlines, the kingdom of God is advancing. It's just the truth. It is, and it advances by the Spirit of the Lord upon His church and upon His people. And when the kingdom comes, the powers of darkness are forced to leave. When the kingdom of God comes, when it breaks in, the powers of darkness are forced to leave, as demonstrated in the life of Jesus. So when light is turned on, we could say it like this, when light is turned on, have you ever been in a dark room and light turns on? Darkness doesn't resist the light. There's no, there's no argument. It doesn't stay dark for a few minutes until it finally wins. When the kingdom breaks in, the powers of darkness are forced to leave, just like dis, light dispels darkness. And I just often meditate on, on one of the things that the Bible says about why Jesus came. In John, 1 John 3, 8 says, the, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. I learned that in a different version. For, thus, for this was the Son of God manifest to destroy the works of the evil one. 
This is why he came, to destroy the works of darkness. So wherever Jesus went, darkness had to flee. You know, when John the Baptist was in prison and he sent his disciples to Jesus to say, hey, is, to find out, is he the Messiah? When they came to Jesus, Jesus said, hey, go back to John and tell him what you saw and what you heard. There was something about seeing something. It wasn't just hearing a message. There was a seeing of something. Tell him the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have received good news. The kingdom is breaking in. See, the gospel of the kingdom advancing isn't only with words. It was with super dem supernatural demonstration of power. Destroying the works of the devil. Destroying the works of sickness. Destroying the works of torment. Destroying what is destroying his people. Do you know that Jesus still does this today? It's the same way the kingdom of God advances today. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm, I'm thankful Stephen's here. He's back in town. My amen man. Yeah. You all are like clapping for him. You love him too. I do too. I want to jump right into a remarkable story this morning out of John chapter 9 about a man who was born blind that had an encounter with Jesus. And um, I, I, as you know, I, I teach out of the ESV when I preach uh, primarily, but today I want to read this entire um, story out of uh, John chapter 9 out of the message paraphrase. It is a beautiful, um, beautiful story. So I encourage you to watch it on the screen. If you try and follow along in your, in your actual uh, version of your Bible, it's probably going to distract you from just the heart of it. So go back this afternoon and read it in whatever version you read it in. But today we're going to read it in the message. Are you all ready? Let's jump right in, starting with verse 1. Walking down the street, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, causing him to be born blind? Jesus responded and said, you're asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There is no such cause effect here. Look instead for what God can do. Jesus goes on, we need to be energetically at work for the one who sent me here, working while the sun shines. When night falls, the work day is over. For as long as I'm in the world, there's plenty of light. I am the world's light. So the, the disciples are Jews, right? And they're Obviously, in, in their question, they would have believed that there was some sort of a connection between blindness and any present disability or, 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 or some kind of a physical ailment and sin. That there must be some sort of secret sin that had happened. Something happened back in the day that caused this, and they want to know, who was it? Was it the parents, or was it... The, the son and Jesus firmly responds that it was neither one of their fault. All through the Gospels, um, as you read through, questions are asked of Jesus. And at various times, Jesus doesn't even acknowledge the question sometimes, but asks often a different one. And sometimes, like the disciples, I think we get stuck on the wrong question too. Have you ever been stuck on a wrong question um, in our desire to understand something that's going on in our life or our world um, or make sense of something? How often have we ever wanted to blame somebody for something that's gone wrong? Some difficulty, some hardship, maybe it's sickness, maybe it's a, a diagnosis of some sort. What, what, why did this happen? Why did that happen? And maybe sometimes we might even blame ourselves or blame some other person or even blame God. And Jesus is saying emphatically right here to his disciples, it's the wrong question, guys. It's the wrong focus. And what 
he's saying is this is what you need to do. Instead of asking that question, look for what God can do. Look for what God can do. He's saying this tragedy is actually an opportunity for the power of God to be on display and for the kingdom to come. Look for what God will do. I believe that that right there is a word for us in this room. Look for what God will do. In the midst of what you're facing, look for what God will do. He's teaching his disciples in this moment. He's training them to be, yes, aware of what they see, but to be more aware of what God is up to and what God will do. In the midst of impossibility, look for what God can do. In the midst of what you see with your natural eyes, look for the activity of God and what he will do. Because if I'm focused on a problem and how big that problem is, how ugly that problem is, how great that problem is, it's going to shape and it's going to impact what I believe. And it'll be big problem and little God. Have you ever had big problem, little God mindset? One person is honest in the room. But here's the thing, if I'm focused on the greatness of God and who he is in regards to that problem, what's going to happen is that faith will rise up and I'm going to approach that impossibility with an expectation of what God will do. Not why did this happen, but what will God do in this circumstance? Not why did this happen? But what will God do in this circumstance? Some of us, I believe, have gotten stuck, we could say, arrested, even in our development, simply because we've been asking the wrong questions. Reciting over and over and over the problem, asking why, asking who, asking all these questions and trying to blame something, force and figure it out. Maybe what we should ask is what and start asking what will God do? We know this, the more, that, more time that we actually think about something, those thoughts and those pathways actually get wider and wider. We've talked about this a bunch. Neuroscience calls these mindsets our neuropathways, and the more we think about something, the bigger it gets. And our mind and our thoughts actually create the culture we live in. What you're thinking about continually actually creates the culture internally of your life. The landscape of our mind is created by the thoughts that we dwell on. So our life then becomes the outcome of our thoughts and our beliefs. The greatest stronghold blocking the purposes of the supernatural activity of God in our lives is almost, between, almost always between our ears how we think about things. You think about the cycles of like, oh, if I'd done this differently, if I'd done that better. Like, you know, something's going on with your adult child and you're like, oh, if we just not done this or we not done that. I feel like Jesus today is saying, wrong question, don't go down that lane. Stand here and expect and look for what I will do. Look for what I will do. You say, oh, this went wrong, that went wrong. Oh, if only I'd done this, if only I'd done that, if only this had happened. I feel like today the Lord's saying, that's the wrong question, that's the wrong mindset. Give your attention to me and look what I will do. Look for where I'm active. Look for what I'm doing in this moment. Because those other lines of thought and cycles of thought are only going to take you to a bad place. I want to set you free and I want you to look at what I'm doing. Look at what I'm doing. Jesus is saying it's, it's not what you think, but get ready because the works of God are about to go on display in this man's life. In other words, the reality of heaven coming and breaking in is happening right now. We're going to get to work on what my father sent me here to do. And I don't know about you, but I, I love a little holy imagination. And I imagine, I like to call it holy In my mind, it's these little ideas. But I imagine just Jesus like rolling up his sleeves. He's like, let's get to work. Verse 6 says, he said this. Let's get to work. And he spits in the dust. And he made a clay paste with saliva. Do you know saliva spit? (laughs) Just wanted to give you that revelation today. He rubs the paste. You're like, man, I'm learning so much at Hope. 
He rubs the paste on that blind man's eyes. And he said, go wash at the pool of Siloam. Siloam means sent. The man went and washed and saw. Soon the town was buzzing. His relatives, those who year after year had seen him as a blind man begging, were saying, why, isn't this the man we knew who sat here and begged? Others said, it's him all right. But others objected. It's not the same man at all. It just looks like him. He said, the man said, it's me, (laughs) the very one. They said, how did your eyes get opened? A man named Jesus made a paste with a spit. That's my version. And rubbed it on my eyes and told me, go to Salome and wash. And I did what he said. And when I washed, I saw. I did what he said. I did what he said. And when I washed, I saw. There's a lot in that. So where is he? I don't know. They marched the man to the Pharisees, (laughs) naturally. This day when Jesus made the paste and healed his blindness was the Sabbath. And the Pharisees grilled him again on how he'd come to see. And he said, he put a clay paste on my eyes and I washed and now I see. Isn't this so beautiful? Blind from birth and now can see. The light of the world breaks into darkness, this man's darkness, and the light dispels the darkness and now he can see and the people around him can hardly recognize him anymore what a picture here on so many levels of what happens when the transforming good news of Jesus Christ opens our blind eyes We don't look the same anymore. People that walk by us every single day don't recognize us anymore. We don't talk. We don't live the same anymore. People ask, is this the same person? It looks like him, but they used to be this. They used to be that. They used to lie. They used to cheat. They used to sit here and beg for all kinds of stuff. They used to live in all kinds of different lifestyles. What happened? Well, Jesus happened is what happened. Jesus happened, and this is still what happens for anyone who responds to Jesus because Jesus changes everything. He opens blind eyes. Church, this is straight up the good news of the gospel of Jesus. There's something so powerful in the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of him breaking into darkness and and setting us free from darkness and causing us to be able to see And instead of celebration, instead of rejoicing because he can see, the Pharisees grill him on how this happened and who healed him. In verse 16, it says, Some of the Pharisees talking about Jesus said, Obviously, this man can't be from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. Isn't it amazing? A guy that's born blind that could not see, all of a sudden can see. And they're all up in arms and mad about it. Because this healing happened on the Sabbath. And what happened here is that it upset the religious tradition. And this is what happens when God does a new thing. When God does a new thing, it upsets people. It upsets the religious traditions. If you're stuck in an old thing, you won't be able to step into the new thing. If all you can see is the old thing, you won't be able to see the new thing. And it's true for all of us. This is what's playing out right here. 
the Pharisees insistence on staying within their self-imposed interpretation of the law, their traditions that were add-ons to what the, act, the scripture actually was teaching, shows how out of touch they are with the heart of the Father. So out of touch with the plan of God. And by Jesus healing on the Sabbath, he was bringing them back to the truth that acts of mercy were actually appropriate on the Sabbath. And God is doing a new thing through Jesus. And that new thing is bringing healing. And that new thing is bringing hope. And that new thing is dispelling darkness, whether it's on the Sabbath or not. See, God never violates his word, but he often violates our understanding of it. God never violates his word, but he often violates our interpretation or understanding of it. That's why we have to stay open to the spirit of God and let his word speak to us in fresh ways. Because if we get steeped in something that isn't him, he, we, we create all these kinds of things that aren't him. And God wants to blow that away so that we can actually carry his heart, can actually walk with him. Verse 16, some of the, we just read it, some of the Pharisees said, obviously this man can't be from God, he doesn't keep the Sabbath. Others counters, countered, how can a bad man do miraculous God-revealing things like this? There was a split in their ranks. They came back at the blind man, you're the expert. He opened your eyes. What do you say about him? He said, he's a prophet. The Jews didn't believe it. They didn't believe the man was blind to begin with. <laughs> so they called the parents of the man, now bright-eyed with sight, and they asked him, is this your son, the one you say was born blind? So how is it that he now sees? And his parents respond and said, well, we know he's our son, and we know he was born blind, but we don't know how he came to see. We haven't a clue about who opened his eyes. Why don't you ask him? He's a grown man. His parents were talking like this because they were intimidated by the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anybody who took a stand, that this was the Messiah, would be kicked out of the meeting place. That's why his parents said, ask him. He's a grown man. Nice parents. And what we're seeing here is fear. What we're seeing here is fear. Fear is operating in the Jewish leaders. And fear is operating in the parents. And the Pharisees are afraid of the new thing that Jesus is doing. They're afraid of the unknown and they're afraid of their entire religious system getting turned upside down. And the parents are afraid because if you were caught saying Jesus is the Messiah, you'd get kicked out of the synagogue. And it would affect your entire social life. It would, it, would, it would impact your financial status. It might even impact your very life. It could be at risk. In their culture, the synagogue was the focus of the entire community. So if you were kicked out, you might as well relocate towns. It's not like Springfield where if you were kicked out of Hope Church, you'd have 15,000 other choices. <laughs> so this miraculous healing, the kingdom breaking in has caused fear. It's caused up. Evil. It's caused a, um, a bit of a mess here. I want to just say this to you. I, I felt this as I was in this passage just to just speak this prophetically over people in our house that there are some of you that are stepping into a new thing in God and it's going to upset the people that are around you. There are some of us that are stepping into new places in God and it's going to upset some of the people around you. Some of you that are making decisions to leave old places that you've been and step into new places that he's leading you. Some of you are making decisions to step out of an old life. 
I've met multiple people recently that have begun to come to hope. And I, it's so beautiful to see the Holy Spirit working. Jesus working. They say, we used to come home from work every single day. And the first thing we would do is break out the liquor. And we'd drink all night. And now they said, you know what? Nobody told us not to, but now we don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> right? They're like, we used to come home and watch all kinds of awful things on Netflix. And guess what? All of a sudden, we just don't want to do that anymore. I'm telling you what. That, that's, I, I believe that there are people here that are making decisions to step out of an old life that's not bringing life, and it's scary, and you know that it's going to cost you. But I want to declare to you today, do not fear because it's actually not safe to stay where you've been. It's time to move on. It's time to move on. I've said this before, but when God does a new thing in your life, it often upsets the old. And we're seeing that right here. Come on. I'll tell you, when Jesus touches your life, it will upset the world around you. We got to break off the lie that when Jesus starts doing something in our life and transforming us, that it's like, like glory to glory looks like ease to ease. It isn't ease to ease. I'm telling you, when we start, when Jesus touches us and, and starts working in our life, man, that leaving the old places cost us. When God starts moving in your life and you get baptized in the Holy Ghost and you start speaking in tongues and you start actually believing that he wants to move like he did in the book of Acts, it will upset the religious spirit. It will upset people in your life. It will cause problems. Verse 24, they, they called this man back a second time. The man who'd been blind and told him, give credit to God. In other words, not Jesus. We know this man is an imposter. And this man replies, he says this, he says, I know nothing about that one way or the other, but I know one thing for sure. I was blind. I now see. I was blind I now see. And they said, what did he do to you? What did he do to you? I love this. People should be asking, what did he do to you? This, this just preaches itself. What did he do to you? If nobody's asking, what did he do to you? It's time to let him do something to us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> for real, what did he do to you? What did he do to you? What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I've told you, the guy says, over and over, and you haven't listened. <laughs> Why do you want to hear it again? Are you so eager to become his disciples? I love that. It's so hilarious. With that, they jumped all over him. You might be a disciple of that man, but we're disciples of Moses. We know for sure that God spoke to Moses, but we have no idea where this man even comes from. I'll tell you what, don't you love it when God moves in your life or does something supernatural that can't be explained and religious people get all like, well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. It just happened. God did it. When God moves in your life, there is going to often be opposition and there's often going to be pushback. Don't be surprised in it, you guys. The man replied, this is amazing. You claim to know nothing about him, but the fact is, he opened my eyes. He opened my eyes. It's well known that God isn't at the beck and call of sinners but listens carefully to anyone who lives in reverence and does his will. That someone, Jesus, opened the eyes of a man born blind has never been heard of ever. If this man didn't come from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. You guys, this guy has a revelation. He has a revelation. He has an encounter 
with Jesus Christ. It's like this former blind man is saying, I don't know about all your squirreliness that you're talking about and all of that. I don't know. I don't know what he did to me. I don't even know how he did it. It was kind of gross how he did it. But I don't even understand all that. What I do know is that for my entire life, I couldn't see, but now I see. I didn't, I didn't know what the sky looked like. I didn't know what my mom looked like. I didn't know what my wife looked like. I didn't know what a tree looked like. I didn't know what the color blue looked like, right? I didn't know any of these things. If this man didn't come from God, he wouldn't have been able to do what he did. And all of a sudden, this guy has a testimony. He doesn't even fully understand everything or get it all. But he knows that he can see. And he has a story and an encounter with Jesus that nobody can take away. That nobody can take away. And get this, as he's being questioned, as he's just getting railed on by sticking to his testimony, he was able to resist the accusers. By sticking to the testimony, he was able to resist his accusers. Church, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. I'm telling you, there's a connection in this. We resist accusation by sticking to our testimony. We resist the accusation of the enemy or of people by sticking to, I don't know about all of that. What I do know is I was blind, but now I see. Church, I think sometimes that we make the idea of sharing our faith so complicated and scary, but what if sharing our faith, what if being a witness is simply sharing your story of how you were blind, but now you can see? What if... Think about this. What if you don't have to have all the answers about everything? Have you ever thought, I don't want to talk to somebody about Jesus because what if they ask me this or that and I don't know the answer? Like, you know what I mean? Like, Like, what if you don't have to understand theology perfectly? What if you just shared how you came to know the one who is perfect theology? How he took you from darkness how we brought you into light. How can people argue with your story of your life transformed by the goodness and the power of Jesus Christ? I want to tell you today, there is power in your testimony. We have to be talking about what God has done. We have to be, there was something that happened last week as I was standing in the front row in worship. There, uh, this thing came out of me and I said, we need a testimony today. Like we need to hear what God is doing. We need to talk of what God is doing. I hear all these things around the church and around people's lives, but guys, we got to be talking about what God is doing. We got to be saying it out loud together. It's not going to be our wise and our persuasive words. I'm not against apologetics. We should do well with that. We should have theology. We should understand the scriptures. I'm not saying any of that. But it is going to be through a demonstration of the power of God where we get to say like this man, I know God is real. I know Jesus is real because if he wasn't, he wouldn't have been able to do what he's done in my life. Come on, that's the power of a testimony. That is the power Hebrew word for testimony, I taught about this in Transform the other night, means to repeat, return, testimony, do it again, do it again, do it again. Testimonies aren't just encouraging stories that make us feel a little bit better. Every time we hear a testimony or we share one, it's an invitation for God to do it again. It's an invitation for God to do it again. I love Revelation 19.10 says, says this, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Your story of darkness to light, how you were blind, but how now you see, prophesies of what Jesus wants to do in the life of the person you're sharing him to. Your story of... God healing your body prophesies to others of what God can and what God desires to do. Whenever you share a testimony of healing or of something that God has done, it releases faith into an atmosphere for God to do it again. 
I can't tell you how often when we share what God has done, even in a gathering like this, how often it happens in someone else in the room as we share that testimony. I'll tell you, there's been so many times where we've shared a testimony of healing, a simple healing testimony. Somebody else gets healed. Multiple people get healed. We, we share those stories of God's, God's breaking in, God's activity. It opens up. It's an invitation for God to do it again. What if you sharing your story, your personal encounter with Jesus is exactly what the people around you are waiting for? You know those people that you look at and you're like, oh man, I know they don't know Jesus. I know they're so lost, but I just don't know what to say, right? They're not looking for you to preach. There's a place for preaching. They're not looking for you to argue with them about their buttons. If you were here last week, you'd get that. You know, like they're not. I think... Many of us don't share Jesus with people because we think we need to have a three-point sermon ready and we say, ah, oh, i got to save that for the professionals. And it just feels awkward and weird, right? What if those who don't know Jesus just need to know how you were blind, but now you see? I'm serious. Think about this, you guys. Church, what would happen? How is the world going to know? The world isn't going to be able to just know through just a few pastors or teachers or evangelists. It's going to take the body of Christ walking with the testimony of Jesus in their life, sharing the good news of Jesus in their story. What if your story of how your eyes were open caused their eyes to be open for him? What if his love story for you is all that you have to share? How he's been so good. How he's been so kind. Think about the woman at the well, right? Jesus has this encounter with her. She went back and she tells her whole town about um, what, what happened to her in her encounter with Jesus. And it says many came to know Jesus because of her testimony. Just telling her about the, telling those people about those few moments where she encountered Jesus. What if they just need that, church? What if they just need to have a conversation and that conversation opens the door and the Spirit of God begins to move on your simple little story? The city, I just declare this over us, the city needs your story. The city needs, the people you work with need your story. I think the enemy loves to make this super complicated. And all of a sudden, I can't, I can't share, I can't do this, I can't do And it's like, no, 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 no. They just need your story. And it may or it may not be received. Are we willing to share our story even if it's not received? We got to get out of this mindset that when we're really anointed, everything goes well. We just look at the life of Jesus. It didn't go well. But it went well. Right? Like, all of the apostles, but John were like, Martyred. God bless you. After he tells them his story, this is how they respond to him. Verse 34, they said, you're nothing but dirt. How dare you take that tone with us? And then they threw him out in the street. The religious spirit can get really ugly. Everybody isn't going to be pumped about what Jesus has done in you. The religious spirit gets really ugly and they miss the whole point of the story because they were asking the wrong questions too. And completely missed that the works of God were on display right in front of them. That the kingdom had come right there in their midst. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out and went and found him. I read that and I was like, man, I just felt like tears coming down this guy that's like had this incredible time and he's just getting bombarded with all the assault and criticism. And Jesus heard that they'd thrown him out and he went and he found him and he asked him, do you believe in the Son of Man. And the man said, point him out to me, sir, so that I can believe in him. 
He's open. This miracle has caused his heart to be opened. And Jesus said, you're looking at him. Don't you recognize my voice? Here's his response. Master, I believe. I believe. And the man said, and he worshiped him. Jesus then said, I came into the world to bring everything into the clear light of day, making all the distinctions clear so that those who've never seen will see. And those who have made a great pretense of seeing will be exposed as blind. That's a sermon right there that I can't get into today. Some Pharisees overheard him and said, does that mean you're calling us blind? (laughs) Uh, yeah. (laughs) Duh. But Jesus doesn't say duh. (laughs) Jesus says this, and it ends. If you were really blind, you'd be blameless. But since you claim to see everything so well, you're accountable for every fault and failure. That's a powerful invitation to humility. And Jesus brings the whole story full circle. In other words, he's saying, though blindness itself isn't an indication of sin, claiming to be able to see when you can't certainly is. And the passage ends with this former blind man believing and worshiping Jesus. And the kingdom has come. His physical, his spiritual sight fully whole. And guys, nothing can take it away from him. Come on. There is a world, this is what I want to say to us today. There is a world around us who cannot see that desperately need an encounter with Jesus. Do you believe this? That need a demonstration of the power and the love of Jesus in their lives. And those of us who can see because of grace, those of us who can see because he's opened our eyes, not because we're awesome, but because he has opened our eyes, we owe it to those who cannot see to share our story. I want to just suggest you, will you listen to me? And I'm going to close in just a second here. There are people at your workplace. There are people at your school. There are people in your neighborhood that live right next to you, your coffee shop, all around you who need to hear the testimony of Jesus that's in your life. They need to hear how Jesus found you, how he loved you, how he changed you, how he delivered you, how he set your feet on solid ground, how he picked you up and turned you around and set your feet on the solid ground. They need to hear your story, which is the testimony of Jesus because testimonies reveal his goodness, reveal his heart, reveal who he is. And every time we tell a story of what he's done, it's an invitation for him to do it again and it glorifies him. What if you're sitting there right across eye to eye with your neighbor and the Holy Spirit is upon you because he is upon you and you just begin to talk about the goodness of God in your life and what Jesus did for you and all of a sudden it just that, that, that other person, their heart just begins to open up and it's just your story. It's the testimony of Jesus that's prophesying right into the heart of your neighbor of the love that he has for that guy or that girl. When you share how God intervened in your life, it causes others to have an anticipation. Church, every time we tell a story, it invites him to do it again. And it glorifies him. The story of a marriage restored glorifies Jesus. And it also invites him to do it again in the life of somebody else. The testimony of a relationship restored, of a healing in a body, it invites him. Faith rises up. It invites him to do it again in that person. An addiction that is broken, it invites him to do it again. And it tells the world who he is. I want to just say this to you. I feel this is connected to the message, but a little separate. If you are discouraged in life right now, I want to remind you, start talking about what God has done. 
If you're discouraged in life, if you're depressed in life right now, discouraged, you've got, you got to remind yourself of what he's done. If you can't remember, I want to tell you, here is a book filled of remembrance of what he has done. I'm telling you, get that book out. What God did in here is your testimony, the Old and the New Testament, all of it. What he did for the children of Israel is your story. What he did in the Gospels, what he did in the early church, it's your story. And the promises that are in here that are yet to be fulfilled, they are your story. And we got to strengthen ourselves in the Lord and look for what God will do. Psalm 77, 11 and 12 says this, but then, the psalmist says this, but then I recall all you have done. O oh Lord, I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. What would happen if we started just fixing our mind on the mighty works of God? What if we started fixing our mind on what God has done, what God said is to be rather than what isn't all around us? I want to tell you, if you're discouraged, don't sit around with other discouraged people. If you're, if you're really down, if you're depressed, don't sit around with other depressed people and be depressed together. Get around people who will tell you their story. Get around people who will tell the testimonies of Jesus. Ask people to share what God has done. Don't stay in that place. Then go back to the other depressed people and the discouraged people and bring the story and the life that you're carrying now. Is that a good word or what? I'm telling you today, you got you to resist that. you got to push into the testimonies of God. you got to say, I'm going to fill my mind, this space between my ears, with what God has done. Regardless of what I see in the natural, I'm going to be looking for what God can do. I'm going to be looking for what God will do. Would you stand with me this morning? I want to invite every one of our ministry team to come forward. I believe that God wants to heal in this room today. I believe that God wants to save in this room today. I believe that God wants to set free in this room because I know that the kingdom is here and it is coming in this room. Do you believe that? Okay, I'm I'm glad a few of us do. I want to ask, just ministry team, just come as quick as you can. We've got a few minutes here and I want us to have some time to respond. I want to ask this um, before we do though. I want to ask, how many in the room today, um, God has physically healed you at some point in your life? Raise your hand. Higher. Okay, guys, look around this room. This is the testimony of Jesus. We should give the Lord a big shout of praise for that. That's probably, it's probably like, I don't know, 75 hands that went up. God physically healed. I believe God wants to heal today. I believe he wants to do it again today. How many people in this room have had a marriage restored? Okay, come on. I think there's eight. Come on, give him a shout of praise for that. That's a testimony of Jesus. I believe he wants to restore marriages today. What God did in in those people, I believe he wants to do again today. Okay, how many people God has set you free from some sort of addiction or some sort of torment in your life? I want you to raise your hand. Come on, look at all these hands all over the room. God set these people free, the power of Jesus Christ. Come on, give him a shout of praise. Now I know that I sound I know that I sound really pumped and hype but this is not hype this is how we overcome This is the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy, saying this is what he's done. This is what he does. This is what he wants to do. The last one I want to ask, how many people have been at the end of your rope? I mean, at the end, you were at the bottom of the bottom, and God broke in and moved in your life and lifted you up. Come on. Yep. Look at these hands, you guys. Look around. You got to look. Look around. This is is who he is and this is what he does let's move out of the place of fixing our eyes on what isn't and let's bring our mind and bring our hearts into an expectation of what God will 
do.